Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 193, Dungeon Delving, discussing RPG in a box style board games. Great board games for RPG fans. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. And if you're a few minutes late, that probably won't matter because we're not so great at starting exactly on time, but we'll be there at some point. Uh, so tonight, we've got a question from Jim Loves Games, that's Jim Crocker, looking to hear about more RPG in a box style games. That came out weird. More RPG in a box style games. After that, we've got a featured review of Black Brim 1876, which isn't an RPG in a box. It's rather an escape room in a box. Uh, we wrap up with our usual week and review, where the big thing is I talk about hosting my first public play event since 2019. Um, I've also got first thoughts on Boba Mahjong and Disney Sorceress Arena, and even more to talk about. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, we've got a comment from Bez from Stuff by Bez about our Rail Pass review. Sounds like such a great game to play with like-minded folk. I hope to give it a go one day. Well, thanks for the comment, Bez. Uh, it's great to see people still discovering some of our older content. It always makes me happy when one of our reviews from months ago suddenly gets a comment on it. And I'm like, yay, someone found it. Well, Extamat, comment on our Ask the Bellhop segment from episode 160, Patents, Copyright, and Trademarks. Oh my. To say great video, guys. I made up a new board game, and I just keep it a secret in my house because I have no idea what to do with it beyond making it. <laughs> well, I think the next step would be get people to play it. And then if you think there's a good chance it'd be a hit, you can then look into legally protecting the game, as we talk about in that episode. Whatever way you go, I wish you luck with your new game. Sadly, it's a bit of a catch-22, as anything published can be stolen, but you also can't protect things without publishing them in some form. Well, next up, we've got a comment from Peter Kisner on our Ghost Betwixt review. They said, thanks for the review. Seems a lot more complicated than I might have hoped for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate this comment, Peter. Um, the reason for that is our main worry with the Ghost Betwixt is that people aren't going to get what they expect if they go out and buy it. And if we can stop that from happening, I think we're doing our job as reviewers. While I guess it's not great for Innocent Traveler games that Peter and others may not pick up the game because of our review, I think in the end this is a good thing. Because we don't want people out buying games they're not going to end up enjoying. You'd rather have a happy customer than a bunch of upset ones. What I can only hope that more people read, listen, or watch that review, as well as well, all our reviews, uh, so that we can make more, everyone can make more informed decisions when game buying. That's what we're here to do, is to tell you about games and to answer questions about games. Part of that being telling you what you probably should or shouldn't buy. Well, next, a couple of comments from last week's episode, starting with this comment from Josh Wales on Dice Camp about our Racco review. Racco is a good game. Mm -hmm. They used to have Super Racco as well, but they don't sell it anymore. It's multiculture and features two simultaneous racks. Multicolor, not multicultural. <laughs> I thought I said multicolor. No, I heard multiculture. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's multicultural. I don't know. Maybe a diverse team made that game, though. Based on its time period, I'm guessing not. I had to actually look up Super Racco on BGG, and now that I did look it up, I think I have a Grail game. I haven't had a Grail game in years, except for the Ghostbusters 2 International RPG box set. That's That's been there forever. I don't think I'll ever find a reasonably priced copy of that, but now i got to add Super Racco to that list, because it looks like the same game, except you have this weird plastic rack that sits so cards go on both sides, and you're trying to build two different sets of number, one blue and one red. But of course, your racks randomize not only the order, but the colors, so you have Reds on the blue side and blues on the red side. And the neat part, though, is it's not just Racco. 
there are special cards like a wild card that you can put anywhere there's one that you play it and you swap your cards in a specific spot so you swap like what's on the left to the right and there's even reverse cards so that if someone plays a swap on you they can play a reverse to make you swap instead so you get into strategies where you're like i need to swap my eight and seven so i'm going to play a reverse on you thinking i know you have or sorry a swap because i think you have a reverse because i actually want to reverse my own once you get into that level of gaming i'm like that's a step above racco that sounds fun to me all right well finally ben green commented on the ask bellhop segment from last week where we shared games from our childhood we would still happily play he asks do you remember this gem inner circle was a race to get your pawns to as many of the goal spots as possible because the goals were holes to the next board underneath and you kept eliminating pieces with smaller and smaller boards until there was just one left. Such a neat mechanic. So Ben shared a picture of this game along with this. And as soon as I saw it, I remember the game. Not because I played it in my childhood, but I remember the commercials for it when I was growing up. Not like a specific jingle, but I totally remember this board where you would pick up the boards and the everyone that's on the top board, except for the ones on the goals, would disappear. And then there'd be less playing pieces. And in the end, you literally end up with the last spot in the center, which looks like this little mountain with your pawn sitting on top of it. I got to say, this does look really cool. It does seem like something I would probably enjoy playing today and actually probably would have been a big hit last Saturday at the barbershop bar. It was like the right kind of game for that so while it's not i'm, I'm not going to put it on the grail list it's definitely <laughs> one that i'm going to keep my eyes open for uh, it's the kind of thing i expect to maybe run into like at a value village or something like that at this point well that's it for this week's comments send your feedback by commenting on our posts emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com sending us a message or tagging us on social media we're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Jim Crocker of Jim Likes Games. Jim writes, Hey Bo, have you ever done a show devoted to RPG in a box, as I call them? Gloomhaven, Pathfinder, card game, etc. I'm not much of a board gamer, but I really like that kind of thing. Co-op with progression and such. Well, thanks for the comment, Jim. Uh, not only have I met Jim a handful of times at gaming conventions, I don't think we've ever actually sat down at the same table and played a game before, uh, but I've also bought a number of games off him at cons as he used to set up one of the best vendor booths I've ever seen for indie RPGs. Uh, that's actually where my copy of Tales from the Loop comes from, uh, my copy of Carry, a game about war, who I got Nathan to sign, and my copy of Phil Vecchione's Hydro Hacker Operatives came from. So it was cool to see something coming in from Jim. As for ever having done a show on RPG in a Box games, no, we haven't. At nope. least not until tonight. Now, while we have mentioned various dungeon crawling board games and adventure games in the past when answering questions on other topics, we've never done a show specifically highlighting this genre of games. So Jim calls these RPG in a box games, but I think most people refer to this style of game as either dungeon crawlers or adventure games. But I think overall, we're going to have to narrow down exactly what games fall into this category, at least for our conversation tonight. Maybe not trying to polish the bucket and make a little perfect box to put them in, but at least to narrow down our conversation. Now, Jim has helped us out but here by calling these RPGs in a box. By doing so, we know he wants games with RPG elements, and he <laughs> specifically mentions two of these, cooperative and having some form of progression. So that's definitely going to narrow things down quite a bit, eliminating an awful lot of what I would call like generic fantasy games with fantasy elements and war games. So I'm going to ask you, Sean, what do you think makes a game a dungeon crawler? Well, I mean, first off, I think it needs uh, some form of map progression. Again, if you're talking about dungeon crawling, <laughs> especially uh, you need a dungeon or some, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a fantasy dungeon. Uh, it could be a spaceship or what mm -hmm. have you but there needs to be some form of sort of movement progression as well as with like Jim suggested character progression. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think one of the biggest ones is, is having that character progression or, or team progression. It may not be you play a simple character, but like this could be as simple as gaining new equipment. Like you just get better gear by the time you finish the game or a full on RPG style level up system where you're spending points to increase stats or choosing between cards to add to a deck and games like that, where this is going to knock out games like Doodle Dungeon and One Deck Dungeon because there is no progression in those games. 
Yeah, and I think, well, well, you know, the Doodle Dungeon is a fantastic game. Uh, it's also very, I didn't think about that one's a, no, a Doodle Dungeon is not a solo game. That's the, I was thinking. No, of it's not. One. No, no. I was thinking of Pocket, the Pocket one you just did. Um, and Pocket Book Adventures. Yeah, Pocket There's Book another Book one. Adventures. There is progression in that um, one, actually. There you go. Uh, and I think uh, he definitely, he mentions co-op. So we're looking for multiplayer stuff, which again, rules out that, <laughs> you know, that, and yes. that rules out Doodle Dungeon as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you're looking for something, uh, you know, I suppose you could have a solo game. There's more than enough of these where you're playing multiple characters as a solo campaign. Yep. Uh, but generally we're looking for something that's probably multiplayer uh, exploration with character or group progression. Now, the big other one, and this is going to knock out a lot of games, including some I see the chat room already mentioning, is to really get that RPG feel. And what I think you need is some type of campaign mode where what happens in one game affects the next so that there is a change to the world. Now, I'm not just necessarily mentioning legacy games, but some form of campaign system, even if it's just a matter of you carry over your character who's now slightly better. This is going to knock out all the Zombicide games. It was my main complaint about Cthulhu Death May Die. Um, though good games, I don't consider them RPG in a box due to this. They are, you play through a scenario and that's it. Yeah, and this is this is a tough one. Because honestly, Zombicide um, or uh, the Cthulhu Death May Die are right on that edge. Yes. Um, and the, the problem is they have a campaign, but they don't have carryover. So they don't have the mm -hmm. progression but Correct. they do have campaign, uh, whereas some have, uh, you know, some don't have a campaign, but they do have the, you know, it, it's it's very tough to limit. And, and I think a lot of people are probably going to come down on the side where Death May Die is a dungeon in a box, uh, even though it doesn't have the progression. And, I, and I, I have to say, I agree with you. I want that progression, but... Uh, there is a campaign in Zombie Death May nah, in Death There's May scenarios. Die. There's scenarios. There's a difference between a campaign and scenarios. Well, okay, but S they're completely set... standalone where they don't affect each other at all. No, but there is a set pass path. This is the path you take. You play this scenario, then you play this scenario, and when you're done, you Yeah, but then scenario, scenario three doesn't call back to scenario one at all. Like there's not even a story tied together. It's a bunch of separate events. The only real progression is they get more difficult and more complicated. That that's mechanical. That's to me is not, uh, not a not a story at all. Really, it's a bunch of individual separate stories. But the other thing in that one that knocks it out even more is there's zero character progression. Right, you, your characters don't change at all. You uh, you might no, you do develop during the during the game. I could have sworn. I um, don't remember getting any new abilities or anything. Like yeah, your tracks might go up, and there's a whole thing about maintaining your sanity that's a big part of the game. But you don't like unlock anything new. I could have. Oh, I thought you didn't. I thought that was. I, one guess, of the I guess you, why you collect a few things. Yeah. So I guess there's a bit of equipment. There's the whole thing where you make multiple choices and they go on either side of your player board. But again, no carryover, right? Like, well, like you play the, that character the, for the that one. That was the big problem with that game. And that was one of the things that, that it was reminding me that there was some progression within a scenario is because why aren't we keeping this? Yes. When why we not go to keep the next it? scenario? Yes. Uh, and so that was one of those uh, those tough ones. So, yeah, I think that the big ones is some form of exploration, some form of character improvement, some kind of and some form of progression where where one game affects another. I think those are the three key elements that I want to include in our game tonight. And we've got 10 games that fit that criteria to talk about. And then we got I think it's three other games. I would have to scroll down in our show notes where they break those rules, but we still think they're cool games. And then you're going to have three games that we want to play because all the games we're going to talk about tonight, at least one of us has played, uh, if not both of us. Uh, here, here's a Draconis Invasion. Is that a campaign or not? See, I don't think so. Dark Darkonus Invasion, you got no character. You don't even play a character. That that's well, a that, no, I'm not saying that that doesn't fit into this category. Absolutely not. Yes. Uh, but again, it's it is a campaign. This is the order it's, it's, to me, it's you the go same through and it's the story. Yes. Um, you know, it's the to same. To me, that's the exact same. That's the same as Cthulhu Death May Die. Right. To me, it's it, again, it's a bunch of linked scenarios, but they're not even linked. Like like the Draconis again, like, oh, they're now in the forest. Oh, they're in the swamp now. Oh, they're getting close to the castle. Like, that's your story. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've, we've kind of narrowed this down. We've definitely right. uh, set up what we think 
what we definitely think, yes. need to have. Whether or not everyone's going to agree with us, that's a whole different story. But yeah, uh, true. So I, I will point out that Jeff Seuss is pointing out, yeah, there is some character progression as as you go insane in that game, you then build a skill tree. So there is some. But again, the, the main thing that knocks it out for me is the fact that what I did in Cthulhu Death May Die Scenario 1 versus Yug know, Sothoth doesn't matter when I play Scenario 6 versus Cthulhu. I don't even have the same characters. I don't even need the same players. There's no actual carryover. So now we got a better idea of what kinds of games we're talking about here. Let's move on to share our thoughts on some of the adventure games we played. Now, as usual, this list is in no specific order. And remember that these are our thoughts on dungeon crawling games that we've played and isn't meant to be a comprehensive list of all the adventure games out there. If your favorite game isn't mentioned, hit us up in the comments and tell us all about it. Now, let's start off with one that Jim already mentioned, and that's Gloomhaven. This is a meaty, heavy cooperative, card-driven fantasy tactical combat simulator with a multi-path, almost sandbox-like story progression and a detailed advancement system. Mm -hmm. There is a lot going on this in this game, and it's not easy, which means it's not going to be for everyone. Along with that, the game is a beast in length, featuring almost 100 scenarios as well as the ability to play random dungeons, and that ignores all of the fan-created content oh, yeah. out there. Gloomhaven is a commitment, and pretty much a lifestyle game. Now, of course, we were big into this game before the pandemic, playing mm -hmm. almost weekly, but so far have not returned to it, no. as it would end up being the only game we play, and that's not good for the piles of shame, piles of obligation, or our viewers and listeners. Yes, that's true. Every week, here's what we did in Gloomhaven this week. And honestly, there was a period our show was kind of that. And we got some complaints. We did get some fans out of that too. But we had we were talking a bit too much about Gloomhaven. I will admit, we we are still, it, it's, it's on the menu. It's possible we may return to it. But it'll definitely happen once we have other gaming night schedules and can play some other stuff as well. And that was Gloomhaven which I guess probably could be totally replaced by Frosthaven now that people are getting it, but we haven't played that one yet. So next I have a follow-up to this, which is actually kind of a precursor to this. It's kind of like the Star Wars prequels of Gloomhaven, and that is Jaws of the Lion. Um, this takes the tactical card play, hand management, detailed combat system um, of Gloomhaven and tones it all down. It provides a fantastic five game onboarding system for new players and like this is a game i just wish existed before we played gloomhaven like we might not have lost the first four tries on scenario one had we had this onboarding that kind of interests you introduces you to the 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 rather complicated card management and combo system required to play well i wish this was our starting point to the gloomhaven universe Jaws of Lion is a fantastic gateway to Gloomhaven, and this, I honestly still say, anyone considering playing Gloomhaven or Frosthaven should start. Now, note, while Jaws of the Lion is simpler than Gloomhaven and Frostbraven and any other Gloomhaven games, it's still not simple or easy. It's still fairly difficult. It's still not. This is not a hack and slash dungeon crawler where you're throwing dice and taking wounds and making saving throws. It's a very different style of game. This is still a meaty game, but I still say if you are even considering picking up Gloomhaven or Frosthaven before spending all the money on those giant boxes, at least find a way to play through those fire, first five scenarios of Jaws of the Lion. That way you'll know if you even enjoy this style of game. And that was Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. Learn more about how Jaws of the Lion differs from Gloomhaven through our reviews on the blog and YouTube. Now, next up, Jim mentioned the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Uh, this one's been out for a long time, but has a newer updated revised edition that came out just before the pandemic hit. And I think that's why we haven't seen a lot of expansions for the new edition. Now, that is the version I played. That was released in 2019. It's the one I own and we've reviewed back in episode 115. It's in the cards. Um, we found the learning curve on this one quite steep. The rule book is reminds me of reading the rules for Magic the Gathering with all its weird timing mechanics and stuff. And that's because the Pathfinder Adventure card game does have tournament play. And you could tell the game had been out for many years before this new card set. And it was a little overwhelming. Um, besides that, I do like some of the mechanics in this game. 
For one, it uses a bunch of dice, though oddly, being based on D&D and Pathfinder doesn't use a D20. But you are rolling lots of dice, which gives you that RPG feel. And I really like the way that most of the gear and equipment had two ways to use it, where you could use it on your turn to do something, but you could also use it on another player's turn, which I thought was really neat and showed that cooperation that you get in a good RPG party. Uh, what I didn't like is that when you built the decks for every scenario, you basically used every card you owned. And it just ended up that you were just like facing the same threats, traps, monsters, and puzzles over, over in random places. And you just didn't really get the feel that every scenario was significantly different from the last. Yes, the boss fight was different. The whole game's all about capturing the lieutenant, defeating the henchman, capture the lieutenant, close the sights. Every game started to feel kind of the same, especially when using the same cards. And yes, there are more cards out there and you can add more in, but they still just get randomized with everything else. So to me, that's where it kind of fell apart, though it's fantastic for replayability. When you play that first scenario of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, it's going to be different every time you play it, which opens it up to playing with various different groups. This is one I think Sean needs to try. You never got a chance to try this one out. We should go back to it. I do have the first expansion for the core set that we never even got to. There's some neat stuff going on, and I like it. I just didn't love it. Fair enough. And that was the Pathfinder Adventure card game, specifically the core set. Learn about the newest Pathfinder Adventure core set in our review on the blog and YouTube. Now, moving from the Pathfinder Adventure card game, which most group liked but didn't love, let's move on to an adventure card game we all adore, and that's mm -hmm. the Aventuria Adventure card game, a game set in the world of the Dark Eye or Das Schwarzog. Germany's most popular fantasy RPG. While this game can be played as a two to four player dueling card game, somewhat like Magic, the real draw here is the cooperative story mode. Mm -hmm. This mode features detailed stories based on classic Dark Eye adventures where you will have to get through a number of skill checks before moving on to a combat encounter and where who those combat encounters are often about way more than just beating up on the main baddie. Everyone we've played this game with has loved it. Where Aventuria does fall down a bit is in regards to character progression. Mm -hmm. Now, while you can increase your character's skills and add treasure cards to your decks, it's just not quite enough customization for a game based on an RPG. We also would have liked to have seen more branching paths in the stories, which are both things we've been promised by the publisher will be coming with a future expansion. Yeah, this is a game we would be talking about a lot more often, and we were for a period, but we kind of stopped because it became impossible to get a hold of. Like, we like it enough, we could probably be talking about what we did in Adventuria this week, kind of like we did for Gloomhaven. We tried a new character, we tried a new scenario, we tried this new book. The problem was, we were telling people this, and they were getting mad at us for good reason, because they couldn't buy the game. They're like, stop talking about this great sounding game, you got me sold, I want to buy it, but I can't find it. Well, good news. This is now back in print in North America. Badish news. Before going live tonight, I decided to actually look around to see where I could find it. Like, I've got the notice. It's now available here again. And the only place I can find it on the web right now is direct from Studio 2, who is the North American publisher. So while it's out there and they have copies, I guess it's still going to be a little while before you start seeing that your friendly local game stores or other online retailers. I don't quite know what the holdup is, but at least it is available on the market again. And that was the Adventuria Adventure Card Game, which, of course, you can learn a lot more about the core rules and some of the expansions on our reviews, again, on the blog and YouTube. Now, speaking of games back in print, that leads me to Hero Quest, which technically has a longer name and I can never remember. I think it's like the Hero Quest Adventure System, but I think everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say Hero Quest. This is a dungeon crawling board game originally released when we were kids that really should have been in last week's episode. Like, how did I miss talking about Hero Quest when I was talking about games we played as kids that I still enjoy today? Um, we bought the new Deluxe Super Edition that came out. I totally missed that one last week. I don't know how I messed that up. Anyway, Hero Quest was originally a joint project between Milton Bradley and Games Workshop. It's a very light adventure game set in the Warhammer world without saying it was set in the Warhammer world. Um, now, this one isn't quite cooperative. It's one versus many, where one player is playing like a simplified dungeon master role with the other players cooperating and trying to defeat the scenario. 
Now, the rules here are dead simple, uh, featuring some pretty dated mechanics like roll and move. You literally roll to see how many squares you move your character. Um, there's uh, miss a turn. Like if you hit a trap, you miss a turn. But it does have a lightning quick, fun combat system of opposed rolls using special dice, which at the time was pretty innovative. And now we see all over the place. Um, now, a lot of people grew grew up playing this game and loved it and Hasbro recently brought it back through their Hasbro Pulse crowdfunding thing. Now this new edition is almost identical to the old edition in all of its awesomeness and all of its flaws. While I still find the game to be quite fun, I don't enjoy it nearly as much as many of the other dungeon crawlers and adventure games on the list tonight, but I think this is a game to keep on the list because it has such a huge group of fans, longtime fans looking for a kick of kick in the pants on nostalgia, like are going to still enjoy this game. It's the game you grew up with. They, they have not significantly changed anything except for losing the Warhammer license. So having to redo all the artwork. Yeah. It's important to remember that this was done by Hasbro pulse, not restoration games. Yes. Who could have <laughs> turned this into a better game. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Hero Quest. All right, my next one is Descent or the series of games in the Descent uh thing from Fantasy Flight Games. Uh this started off as a one versus many huge box game. You can see my coffin behind me there. That's the edition I own. Um this has changed over time. It's now on its third iteration um and it's now a fully cooperative game. Now, the first edition, the one I have behind me, was this epic quest featuring giant maps, a series of scenarios that took hours to complete, and eventually telling a complete story over multiple expansions. It was a long, epic, almost lifestyle game. It was it was more of a gloomhaven, right? Whereas second edition improved on things by breaking the game into smaller, more manageable chunks with a much shorter playing time so you could actually fit in one or possibly two games in a night instead of having to dedicate an entire evening to play. Now, partway through second edition, they did something pretty awesome. They released an app which turned the entire game into a cooperative game instead of a one versus many game which also added more scenarios and campaign and legacy elements and ways to keep your progression in the app so that was pretty cool now there's a third game in the series descent legends of the dark which i haven't personally gotten to try but i wanted to throw in here as i'm talking about the descent games anyway now this is also fully cooperative and app based but from what i hear it's very divergent from the first two of the series this isn't meant to be Descent 3rd Edition. It's meant to be a different game in the Descent universe. And from what I hear, it's more based on Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. I can't compare those myself, but I did want to share that. Overall, the series is, is the opposite of Gloomhaven. This is the adventure game. This is the dice-chucking miniature game with a story behind it, mainly just there to set up each scenario and map and challenge you. The Avap event uh, sorry the app adding in branching paths and everything added more of that rpg feel and that was the descent series of games from fantasy flight next i've got mice and mystics our chat room called this one out earlier which is a good good call uh this is a fantasy dungeon crawler with a great theme and an amazing story honestly one of the best stories in a board game out there it feels like you are taking part in a children's storybook though i gotta say this is not a kid's game as i learned trying to teach my kids way too early this is a this is a heavier one it's a it's a dice-based mechanic tactical miniature driven combat but also some puzzle solving having to deal with you know like rush water or using the right tool in the right place now the thing missing here though is character progression other than getting new gear really all you have is the story progression like the things carry over how you did you can unlock some achievements but you don't get a lot of change to the characters so they do do some neat stuff where new options open up new tools open up and even a new character will open up part way through so there's some of that there this one was borderline for me i wasn't quite sure to throw it on the list but it, i think it captures just enough and I just love the theme of you are playing like a prince in his retinue who got turned into mice and having to resolve that. And that was Mice and Mystics. Now, this one's a logical follow up. Sticking with Plaid Hat Games, storybook games, we have Stuffed Fables. This, despite being from the exact same team that did Mice and Mystics, is a much different game. It's it's much easier to learn. It's got a more family-friendly story because I got to say the being turned into mice is more, um, not horror, but like 
oh, you're mice and you're you're being hunted and tried to kill. Whereas this is much more whimsy and family friendly and honestly just a much more approachable game overall with simpler mechanics, uh, more compartmentalized, easier to put away and take out. Now, the story here is amazing. This is still my favorite theme in all board games is you are the stuffies of a little girl who's about to spend her first night in her big bed and you have to defend her from the things under the bed. And I'm like, that, that is just awesome. I want to play this as an RPG. If it's not out there yet, someone must have done it. I would totally do this as an RPG. Now, this features a branching path and a mix of combat, non-combat adventures. While Mice and Mystics was pretty much just move on to the next combat, there was a whole adventure where you're sitting there in a toy cart, bouncing down a pile of toys in the dreamlands, having to make skill checks to hold on, right? It just did so much more. Unfortunately, unlike Mice and Mystics, though, there is not a lot of character progression here, but the story makes up for it. This is also the first game we mentioned tonight that doesn't have a fantasy theme. And that was, well, a specific style of fantasy. <laughs> High fantasy, I guess. Well, it was, it was, <laughs> it's, it, well, yeah, but it's modern. Yeah. You're, you're using plungers and it's a, it's a kid in a modern bed. It's, it's not, not fantasy as in Fantastical, medieval fantasy. Fantastical, but not medieval fantasy. Yes, yes. And that was Stuffed Fables. Now, sticking with games set in modern times, the next game is The Ghosts Betwixt. This is a retro-modern dungeon crawler set in the 90s in America's haunted heartland. You take on the role of a family trying to rescue one of their kids that has been kidnapped and is being held at an abandoned theme park. This is a pretty meaty, tactical dice-driven dungeon crawler with lengthy gameplay and a mm -hmm. solid campaign. Now, the big draw here is how replayable the game is, with many randomly generated elements used every chapter. This has everything Jim is looking for with complex characters, co-op, different improvement options leading to various different character builds, growing complexity as the campaign goes on. Yeah, we just reviewed this one uh, just right around Halloween, and I encourage you to read my full review before buying this one. The big thing to watch here is to not be fooled by the look of this game. Mm -hmm. Despite the vaguely Scooby-Doo cartoonish look, this is not a Saturday morning cartoon game, neither in difficulty nor theme. That was the Ghost Betwix. So moving from modern to the future, or well, technically a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I have Star Wars Imperial Assault. Now, similar to Descent, this game launched as a one versus many game, where one player took on the role of the Empire and the other players played a band of rebels. Now, this has changed with the release of the Star Wars Imperial Assault app, which now offers fully cooperative play and a more campaign feel. Now, this game features everything Jim's looking for while doing a great job of adding to the Star Wars universe. What I love here is that your characters are first and foremost to the story, and famous heroes and villains of the series only show up as adversaries and allies. Like, you're never going to get to play Han Solo, but Han Solo, if you beat a certain mission, may join you later as an ally to kind of give you a bonus, which I think is really well done. This is some of the best use of the Star Wars license I've seen. You get dice-based combat and character progression through improving equipment and abilities. Perhaps best of all is just how replayable this game is due to the way you basically build a campaign deck at the start of the game, deciding what to include and exclude from every scenario. Uh, based on even just in the core box, there's lots of variability, but every expansion you add gives you more things you can throw into that deck to make things more interesting. Now, as an added bonus, which isn't relevant to tonight's question or Jim's question, you also get a fully realized two-player skirmish miniature game out of this as well. Though I think most Star Wars miniature gamers have moved on to Legion, you still get that in the box. And that was Star Wars Imperial Assault. So that went quicker than I thought. That, that's 10. That was 10 adventure games that we enjoy and that we think are worth checking out if you're looking for an RPG experience in board game form. Now let's move on to a few honorable mentions. These are games we dig, but just didn't quite fit our definition. To start, I've got Mansions of Madness, a Cthulhu Mythos board game. This, like Descent, started off with a first edition that was one versus many. But forget that one. Throw it out. Sell it. Find, find someone to take it off your hands because you want the app-driven second edition of this game. 
Now, in this game, everyone picks an investigator, tells the app what advantage you have, and then start an investigation, which almost everyone, as far as I know, everyone I played starts with you entering a mansion, exploring it and trying to figure out what's going on and then what you need to do to stop whatever horrible thing that is. Now, the game mix features a good mix of puzzles and combat and is quite immersive due to how well the app is integrated with background sounds and voiceover. And the puzzles are actually all done on the app, so you get like physical things to manipulate. While I do feel you get an RPG-like experience here with a variety of characters to choose from and a great story, there's no campaign here. This is not a campaign game. This is more like playing a one-shot with each scenario being its own thing. And I've got to say, you know, this is actually our third app heavy game on yes. this list. And there are certainly going to be some people who will, uh, you know, put up a fight because of that all on its own. It's true. Uh, but uh, to each their own. We've also got several here that have no app integration whatsoever. Now, next up, I've got a solo game that can also be played cooperatively, and that's Hellbringer. Mm hmm. Now, we weren't initially sure if we should put this on the list, since the game isn't actually published yet. Their first attempt at crowdfunding, unfortunately, didn't work out. But they are trying again in the new year in March. They've already scheduled the Kickstarter. So the reason we decided to include this was because it was such a big surprise to both of us. Mm -hmm. This is a card-driven dungeon crawler that recreates the feel of roguelike computer games and the waves of enemies you face in games like Diablo. The deck is your dungeon, and each card drawn represents you digging deeper. It features a unique fog of war targeting system and the rolling of lots and lots and lots of dice. Yeah, this one was really solid. I, I this I, by the time we do a week in review, year in review, this may be our biggest surprise on our in our list here. This was. It was way more enjoyable than we thought it'd be. I really do hope the um, the publisher and designer are able to get this out to people's hands. Um, there's some questionable choices in their, their production choices, I think, are making things more difficult for themselves than they need to be. But I just want more people to play this game. Um, I'm even going to recommend this if you can get a print and play, which I'm not sure if you can. If you can get a print and play, this is a great card game that plays fantastic solo. More than that, eh. Unless he's done some changes, it was okay multiplayer. So that was Hellbringer, which hopefully more people will get to actually play next year. Feel free to check out our preview on the blog and YouTube. Find out why we were so surprised by this one. Now, my other honorable mention tonight is the Warhammer Quest Adventure card game. Honestly, this should be up there with the rest of the games. This would have been number 11. Actually, probably would have been earlier. It's not like they're ranked anyway. I liked it that much. The problem is the game was canceled before it was really able to get going. The fact that it feels like an incomplete box as it is. All that's out there are initial four characters and a sample short adventure that comes in the court set. It's a multi-part adventure, but you can tell it was just like to get you... That give you something to sink your teeth into, but just left you wanting more. And there is no more. Um, there's someone, there's like a, they put out a character that was a promo. You can kind of download that, but there's no more adventures except for what fans have created. As it stands, this is still, even with that, that problem, my second favorite adventure card game, second only to Adventuria. And I got to say, if they had kept putting stuff out for it, it might've grown to be my first. There was just the way you were forced to take different actions. You had a bunch of different actions to take. And as you use them, you flipped them over and then you had an action that would flip them all back. I love that mechanic. And it means that you're not just doing the same thing after you turn after turn, which is something that can drive me bonkers in these kind of games where you're just like, I move and I attack, I move and I attack. You couldn't do that. Plus there was some great ways to take actions on other player turns and help each other out. Plus, I love Warhammer, so just like playing a group of like a troll slayer, a bright mage, a priest of Sigmar, and a war elf fighting waves of Skaven is just awesome to me. Now, I do know this was reprinted as a new game, and I can't remember the name of it. Bad on me for not looking this up. Set in Fantasy Flight's Tyranoth universe, which is where the, all the Descent games are set and where their midnight RPG was set. But the big draw to me besides the mechanics here was the Warhammer without the Warhammer license. I honestly are not even interested in checking it out, even though I did like the mechanics. It just Warhammer means that much to me. Fair enough. That was Warhammer quest, the adventure card game. And I just would like to point out while you can't apparently get Hellbringer print and play right now, if you have tabletop simulator, there okay. is an official 
tabletop simulator mod available. All right, so those are the games we played in the past and enjoyed. But there are a lot of RPG in a box style games that are out there that we haven't played. The chat room's already mentioned a few of them, which we'll get to when we get to the lobby. What I want to do is wrap up with three games we're curious about and would love to try out. Number one for me is Shadow of Brimstone. Shadows. I always think it's Shadow. Shadows of Brimstone. So this features a unique theme of being set in the Old West, where you're going to play Old West stereotypes. You got your lawman and your gunslinger, those type of characters. The thing is, you're investigating a nearby mine, but they have a secret. These mines feature portals to other worlds. Now, the original core set featured a mythos and speakable horror theme and some demons, which did and that's kind of neat to me. But later expansions had mines that led you to like ancient Egypt and another one where you literally go to another planet and fight aliens. And that just something about that really appeals to me. I like the concept of the mashed up universes thrown in with that old West feel. It features tactical miniature-based combat, a system for leveling up your characters between expeditions, where you're going to town in between. Gives me a little uh, foreshadowing, a uh, reminder of like Mordheim-style games, which is a skirmish game, which is why it's not on our list. Um, like squad-based. I I really want to try Shadows of Brimstone, even though I have heard it is a beast to learn and one of the more fiddly games out there. Well. For me, I have to say that while I'm not a huge fan of the cost of their games, Demon certainly does put out some solid ones, especially if you're looking for an adventure in a box. Mm -hmm. In this case, Massive Darkness, a fantasy RPG with all the arguably overproduced beauty that is a Simon game. Asymmetric co-op heroes, XP, equipment gathering, this one has it all. Now, the current version is actually Massive Darkness 2, Hellscape. But either one, I think you're going to get a whole pack of stuff because, well, you're buying a game from Simon. <laughs> yes. How many Simon dungeon crawlers are there? Um, I'm going to throw another one in here just as a bonus. This is on the ones we want to try. It should, could have been in the follow-up, and I wasn't doing research for this episode. Simon's Arcadia Quest came up mm -hmm. a lot. That came up on a lot of other people's recommendations. To me, you are playing a team of three characters, and the only actual progression is whoever won the game gets a benefit later. So it didn't have that progression. So that's why I didn't throw it on the list. But that came up a lot on other... Like, if you Google best dungeon crawlers, <laughs> everyone seems to have that one. Yep. Now, the other game I want to play, I already own. I've got it. It's sitting downstairs, I've even recorded an unboxing video for it, which I think is live. I don't even remember. Um, that's Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. Now, our friends Tori and Kat are currently playing through a campaign of this. They finished the core box and they're on to some expansion content with some of their other friends. And they are loving it. And often they show up Friday nights for game night with us and tell us about their adventures. And that game sounds great. This sounds like it has everything Jim is looking for as well, with an app-driven, again, branching campaign, lots of character progression, true cooperative play, and other RPG elements. It's also well-supported with new content coming out regularly, which is something we didn't really mention above in our games if these games were still out, still supported. Um, this is one that's still got content coming out to it, so it's not a dead game. Whereas, say, Star Wars Imperial Assault at this point is still being published. You can still get everything, but they're not releasing anything new. Uh, this just looks great. Um, the only reason I haven't played it is because Tori and Kat are already playing, and that's who we tend to play legacy campaign games with. We were playing Ghost Be Twix with them, so they played them. Now that Sean's in town, maybe we'll start up a three-player campaign and actually see how good Journeys in Middle-earth is. Well, that's our list of RPGs in a box. Adventure games without the RPG bookcase. <laughs> Do you prefer to dungeon delve from books or boxes? Let us know in the comments. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media where I can be found anywhere, anywhere, everywhere, pretty close, as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, if you'd like to hear what we talk about in our lobby, but couldn't be here live, $5 and up patrons get all the audio otherwise left on the cutting room floor. Welcome to our review of Black Brim 1876, oh. 
a two-part escape room in a box experience from Puzzling Pursuits, who we have to thank for sending a review copy our way. Thanks, Puzzling Pursuits. Black Brim 1876 is an escape room in a box style publish game published in 2020 by Puzzling Pursuits. Uh, it's designed for one to six players, more if you don't mind pairing up for some puzzles, ages 14 plus. We personally say the more the merrier, with five or six players being the real sweet spot. There's also no reason younger kids couldn't play, especially when teamed up with an adult. Now, the game is broken into two parts, with each half taking an hour or two to complete. Uh, we found the first half to be much quicker than the second, with our total time between both spreading over two game nights for a total of about three hours. This box is also part of a trilogy of games that tells a concurrent story. The first installment has a MSRP of $60 USD and is available directly from Puzzling Pursuits, where you can often find it on sale, like right now, using our link. You can get it for only $34.95. Yeah, big price drop there. I have a feeling this is one of those games that you probably are never going to have to actually pay full price, but we'll see. So in Black Brim 1876, a private detective in Victorian England has received a package from the local police department. This package indicates that the entire police force has been kidnapped and are being held hostage somewhere. It's up to you and your team to save them by solving the various puzzles left behind by the kidnapper. Now, I got to say, I totally felt like I was playing a Batman game trying to solve the Riddler's puzzles here, though it was set in Victorian England. Now, note, this is an escape room style puzzle game. This is not a murder mystery or a cold case file. There's no case to solve. There's no putting the clues together. You just have a series of puzzles to figure out. Also be aware that access to the internet is going to be required to play this game. While it doesn't have an app, it does require you to go to a certain web page in order to enter, enter your answers, progress the story, and you're probably going to have to use the web to do some researching to solve some of the puzzles. Uh, technically, that would be Bane who kidnapped the entire police force, not the Riddler. <laughs> <laughs> Bane must have been working with the Riddler for there this particular one. All right. <laughs> for a spoiler-free look. At what you get inside this escape room in a box, check out our Black Brim 1876 unboxing video on YouTube. So when I recorded this video, I, like all these escape room in a box things, I was kind of worried about spoiling anything. I wasn't sure exactly how much information it was safe to share. Now, I've since learned and been told directly from the publisher, you can't really spoil anything by just showing the bits. And seeing the components of this game isn't going to give anything away. Again, there's no mystery. There's no clue. There's just solve the puzzle. So all you're going to get to see is like the pieces that make up the puzzles. So while reading the written review and as well as while watching this, Sean's going to probably pop up some images once we get to the YouTube version. You don't have to worry about anything getting spoiled. Now inside the Black Brim 1876 box, you will find a small instructional pamphlet that explains how the game is meant to be played. Under that, you will find two rather large folders, one for each chapter in the game. Upon opening the first envelope, you will find a wax sealed envelope that introduces you to the story and the materials needed to solve the first chapter. Once you complete that chapter, you're instructed to open the second envelope, which is filled with even more stuff. Now, the quality of the components here is excellent, but everything's paper-based. You're not going to find any strings, balls, marbles, candles, small skulls, or other doodads like we've seen in other escape room-style games. That said, you do get a wide variety of paper products, including a menu, card discs, postcards, art prints, and more. Now, my copy of the game also had a small problem. We got two copies of a newspaper clipping. The box is only meant to have one. Due to this, I recommend checking the contents of the box and comparing them to the inventory list on the website that's in that instruction book. While this doesn't didn't ruin our experience in any way, we did waste quite a bit of time comparing two identical sheets trying to figure out what was different because why'd they give us two? Now, many of the components in the game are made to be written on, and there is one component that is meant to be folded. As designed, this is meant to be a one-and-done, single-play, disposable game. 
That said, with liberal use of tracing paper and scrap paper, we completed the game and left it in a replayable state. Though be warned if you use tracing paper, how hard you press may make some indentations. So there might be one particular puzzle in mind that someone may find a little easy if they hold it up to the right lights. But I think your average group is probably going to want to use the bits as intended and draw all over stuff and fold and trace lines and all that fun stuff. Now, component-wise, we were rather impressed by what you get and the amount of gameplay you get for the price, especially if you can pass it on to someone else or let someone else play. But even as a single-time a single -time experience, I felt like we got plenty of gameplay out of it for the price, especially the discounted price. So now that you have a rough idea of what you get with a copy of Black Grim 1876, let's talk a bit about how you use all of this stuff. So one of my favorite things about escape room style games is there isn't any real prep work needed to play. You don't generally have to punch anything. There's no thick rule book to learn or how to play videos to watch. You just get a group of players together, sit down, open the box and discover it all together at the same time. Now we personally did this with Brap, Black Brim 1876 with five players from three generations in the same family with ages from 12 to 69. The instructions explain how the game works very clearly and will point you to a website that we suggest having open the entire time you are playing. This is web-based, so there's no app to download, and it won't matter exactly what device you're using to get to it. You then crack open the first folder marked Chapter 1 and open the waxed sealed letter you find inside. This sets up the story and points you where to go next. And if you have a daughter like me, she's going to be obsessed about the fact that I want to pass the game on to someone else because she really wants to keep that wax sealed letter. Now, at this point, you're going to have five different puzzles to solve, each of which is completely independent of the others, except for the fact you're going to use the answers to those five puzzles to solve the metal puzzle for part one. What this means is that different players can work on different puzzles at the same time. Or players can work together to solve puzzles, or you can swap puzzles when you get stuck, and so on. Once you have figured out an answer to the puzzle, you go onto the web page and confirm that your answer is correct. If you get stumped, you can also get clues for any of the puzzles. Now, there are multiple clues for each puzzle. I think one even went like eight deep, and each gives you a bit more information, just like kind of a nudging push to make sure you're on the right track. As soon as you get stuck, for the first second millisecond you're not sure, check that first clue. All this does is make sure you have what you need to solve the puzzle. This is the thing that checks your inventory. It's quality control. This is how we figured out we had a duplicate newspaper clipping because we looked up and the first clue said you need the newspaper clipping. That is the only tool you need. If you're missing the newspaper clipping, click here or check here. I'm like, oh, there's only supposed to be one. As each puzzle is independent, after you've confirmed your answer from the web, you can basically put that puzzle away. That's what we did to keep the cable clear and, and you don't want to mess anyone up where they think they need extra bits. You're not going to need anything from any of the puzzles again. Once it's solved, you confirmed your answer, that part of the game is done. Now, after you solve the initial five puzzles, you will have to combine your answers to make one giant Zord. I mean, sorry, combine your answers to get a final <laughs> solution which again, you will enter on the web page. You will then be instructed to move on to part two. Now, while you can do one marathon section and move right into part two, I recommend packing everything up, put everything from chapter one in its envelope, put the chapter two envelope on the top of the box and save that for another day. Now, part two plays the same as part one, but has six different puzzles instead of five. These puzzles are presented in a very different way from the first half, and all of them are more involved with more components. They are all still independent from each other, and solving the final puzzle will require the answers from all six puzzles. Once you correctly guess the final puzzle, you get a bit of a story and are then invited to pick up part two. Now, it's worth noting that this box does include a complete standalone story that stands on its own. While you're going to end up probably wanting more, but you won't be because you're left with a cliffhanger or needing the final answer. It's not like it leaves you hanging. Now, as for the individual puzzles in this game, they run the gamut from logic puzzles, ciphers, codes, pattern recognition, physical manipulation of objects, uh, perception checks, and more. 
Now, one thing to be aware of that as a group, you are probably going to need to do some outside of the game research to solve some of the puzzles. I would honestly be shocked if anyone could complete this with at least one Google search or use of Google Lens. What you won't find in this game is a timer or any form of final score. Unlike mm -hmm. many other escape room in a box style games, Black Brim 1876 is just about working together and having fun solving puzzles without the stress of trying to solve every, any, everything under time constraints or trying to get the highest score possible. Now, when I first read the premise for Black Brim 1876 with all these police people disappearing, I was expecting more of a murder mystery game, something more like the Maple Book case from Hidden Games or Escape Mail, games we've reviewed in the past, where you're solving some puzzles, but the real drive is to solve the mystery to solve the crime. That's not what Black Brim is at all. While there is a story here, it's a pretty simple one, and really it only gives a theme to the various puzzle pieces. This is a puzzle box. You get 13 different puzzles, five in the first chapter with its solution and six in the second chapter with the final solution. This is the main thing I think people need to know before picking up this game. So I guess really it's interesting that it's, this is sold as an escape room in a box, but the yes. lack of any score or timing steps it back from that. And, and I think yeah. that it's almost false to call it an escape room because, you know, an escape room requires a, that goal, right? You have to, there, there's something to beat or not. There's a, there's a yes, no, you win or you don't win in, in a standard escape room. Uh, and so I think some people may find this a little odd as an escape room because it's missing that sort of binary win loss uh, concept. So the way it recreates that is the final goal is to escape from a room. So that that is the the final puzzle is to I guess this is a slight spoiler, but is to to escape with the now freed police officers. Right. So I think it ties it in that way. All right, fair. Now, what I loved about this compared to honestly every other escape room puzzle game we played is the fact the puzzles were 100 percent independent of each other. I love the fact that the five of us playing each basically got to pick a puzzle to try out and try to work out on our own and how that involved into asking each other for help and eventually working together. This, this is interesting because I, I, I'm torn about this. Um, while it's great to have that independent and it, it really does help the player count expand, part of the fun that I have experienced in escape rooms is that need to have the extra thought and the extra, the, the, the cooperation and, you know, right. one person over here on this part while someone else is reading out things from somewhere else. Um, and again, that there, obviously I'm talking about the physical escape rooms, but you can recreate that through mm -hmm. having to interact with multiple puzzles together. And that's left out here, which. Well, again, no, it's not though. Cause your meta game is you've now solved your five puzzles. Now work together to find the answer. Right. That's how you get to chapter two. But and that's it's, how it's, you eventually solve the game is you've happened to take these five disparate parts and then later six disparate parts and somehow put them together. Right. I guess so I, I think I, you're I mean, getting with, that. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's it's hard to say. I mean, we obviously don't want to spoil anything here. So it's yes. hard to it's hard <laughs> to sort of get get exactly how much of that is or isn't there with the uh you know with, with that final meta puzzle. Yeah. And then that said too, I was actually surprised how much another set of eyes or another person or another brain helped to solve puzzles when we did get stuck. Yes. We all start started with our own independent puzzles, but in the end it wasn't right in the first chapter, it worked out that some of us got our puzzles on our own. Like we got it went, Oh, I get this, did the solving, grabbed the app, punched in or oh, excuse me. It's actually drop down menus, but selected the answer and were rewarded with, yes, you figured it out. But then we started having to team up. It was like, you know what? I've looked at this for long enough. Do you see anything I'm missing? Here's what I have so far. And the final, not, not the final solution, but the fifth puzzle gave us the most difficulty. And I'm, I'm not going to mention which specific one, but all five of us teamed up to solve this final puzzle, each coming up with different solutions and ways to try things. And this was a, a more 
physical manipulation style puzzle where there was more to look at. It wasn't just, you know, figure out the cipher, do some math type of thing. This was a like, oh, what if you try this? Oh, how about trying this? What if you hold it this way? And that, that kind of thing. And I love the feeling of like some of us had that, hey, solve this on my own. Others of us had that. We solved this together to it was literally all five of us in the, you know, felt like the final hour, even though there was no time limit, trying to solve that final puzzle. All right, fair. Well, it seems like you, you did get the experience, even if it doesn't necessarily come across that way, hearing about it. Uh, right. The meta puzzle is, is certainly giving you more of that than, than I think uh, I was initially thinking. So that's good to hear. Fair enough. Now, the other bonus to this format that is probably going to affect me more than some other groups playing this together because I have younger kids is this didn't have the arguing we saw in other escape room games or arguing over who got to do what. Um, in particular, some of the card driven escape room games out there are really difficult because you have one deck of cards and one card and all the players are trying to look at the card at once. And we didn't get the whole, well, I want to flip over the next card. Well, I want to see it. Let me see it. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to see that one. You solved the puzzle before I even got to see it. Or can I have a turn punching things in the app, right? We each did our own thing and then worked together when needed without the, the, the fighting and the not having people feeling bad that they were left out. That was great for our particular family. And I think it's going to apply to other groups. Right. And now I know uh, in particular, you'd mentioned to me that there were certain uh, knowledge sets that were yes. required for this game. Uh, which is why you ended up recommending, you know, having Google Lens open or, yes. you know, having some research materials. Uh, is that, you think that's going to be a sort of, you know, a pretty standard thing for, I'm going to say, North Americans that are going to require uh, yes, some of that? I would. Um, I was going to get to that in a bit, but I'll jump to it now. Um, this is actually my one complaint about the game. Um, the, you, you, this is going to, you're going to have to test your Google skills. Uh, the game is clear about this right from the start. It says you will, you may require outside information to solve this puzzle. I knew it was coming, but I really found having to use modern technology kind of broke my sense of immersion the game had. Not that I really felt like as an investigator in 1776, but like I'm pretty sure the inve the investigator you're playing doesn't have an iPad with them, right? And and I guess you could say, well, these are things the investigators of the time would know. But I don't know. It just, it to me, felt like a weak excuse. Yeah, uh, 1876, not 1776. Oh, sorry, 1876. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I think it's it's definitely uh, a stretch. And while I understand uh, the reasons why they've gone this way, and I actually applaud them for not going with an app. Um, yep. I think that the choice of a web page for this is a better choice and good for them. Uh, at the same time... Uh, it's you know the fact that the fact that they're sort of leaning into it as much as they are uh and and not providing you with the information to set yourself up for success uh with the knowledge of that world um of the world of 1876 around you is is a yeah. tricky thing you know we, we're role players um we we've been involved in the SCA <laughs> and other uh you know sort of uh historical replication type things and so the the fact to, of, of getting thrown so far out of yes. that is jarring I, I absolutely agree like basically again i don't want to spoil anything but there are landmarks that if you don't know what those landmarks are you're never going to solve the puzzle there are pieces of artwork that if you don't know the pieces of the artwork you're never going to be able to solve the puzzle like i said there, there's probably a group out there that could play this without having a problem but i think that's going to be rare um, honestly, I found Google Lens to be amazing. Uh, I have a Pixel phone. It has Google Lens built in. All I needed to do was scan some postcards and hit Google Lens and got the answers I was looking for pretty quickly. Um, later puzzles had some other things. The other thing is you have to remember this is in Britain and their currency is different than ours. Again, just slight spoiler, but there's a menu. And part of solving that puzzle is, is doing things with that menu. And if you don't know the 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 annotation for British currency, you're going to want to have to Google that. <laughs> um, so it was a little weird, right? Like it was just a little odd that way. Now that said, the puzzles were interesting. They were all very different. Like I'm, I'm still, these companies blow me away, like the exit games, especially by how they're still putting out content, right? So there's three parts to this. And then they have another three-part chapter 
like game and then they have a christmas one and like i haven't i've only played this one we're looking forward to checking out another one but i'm like how do you keep coming up with these puzzles to be that different like you've got what is it, 13 different puzzles that are very different from each other like some we got right away one of those like you read it and you're like oh i catch that keyword in the title and i bet you it means i got to do this yep look i got to do this and you get to feel smart you're like i got it that's awesome and then other ones took us much longer to figure out <laughs> Um, we did use clues, uh, none on the first chapter. We were good there, except for, again, we had to check the one, the first clues. I don't even count as using a clue. That's make sure you have all the components that were supposed to come for the game. So we did that in the first half and did find a problem. Uh, again, didn't ruin the game because we weren't missing anything. We had an extra thing. Second chapter, we did have to use some clues, but we never had to look up a solution. And again, the clues are presented multiple ways. So it's like, yeah, we figured that part out. Yeah, we figured that part out. Oh, we figured that part out. Oh, that's what that meant. And then go on and solve the rest. Like it, it wasn't even like it gave us a clue that like in the next five seconds we solved it. Not even in the next five minutes. Still took us probably another 15 minutes from that step to solve this one particular problem. That was the one that gave us the hardest time. Which again, by the end, we were like, yep, that, that all made sense. There wasn't, there was no, no, no one would have got that moment, which is the kind of thing that will ruin one of these type of games. Actually, that's the question I had. Darkling Bright brings up in the chat room. Uh, did it use modern British currency? Uh, which is decimal based, or did it use older British currency, which is absolutely not decimal based? <laughs> All I will say is, what is the name of the game? All right. Uh, so, a couple suggestions for anyone who is going to play Black Brim 1876 is for one, have the web page open, use it liberally. Uh, those first clues, use them like, like at all stock. Maybe you're missing a component. Like, I, I hate to say it, but our game had a quality assurance issue. Maybe others do. You don't want to be sitting there spending hours trying to solve a puzzle you can't solve because someone forgot to stick a piece of paper in your box. So use that. It doesn't give you any answers. Just make sure you have what you need. Again, Google Lens is your friend, and it's easier to try and define the right words to search, especially when you don't know exactly what you're searching. Then remember, it's set in England, right? Uh, if you don't know historic England, you might need to do some extra searching compared to other people. Lastly, though, this one's more important to me, is I don't recommend this as a solo experience. What really made this shine was the fact there were five of us and five puzzles in the first chapter, and then six puzzles in the second was an extra. So what? First person to finish the puzzle grabs that leftover puzzle and works on it. The entire game, we found the most common reason for getting stuck was missing something or thinking one thing meant another thing and heading down the wrong path. Having someone else to bounce ideas off of and provide a different perspective was key to us solving this game. I don't think the game would be as enjoyable as a solo experience. And in this case, I think the more players, the better. I would even suggest and, and can see playing with seven or eight or even 10 players, having people team up right from the start to work on individual puzzles. No other escape room game I played can I recommend at these higher player counts. Well, at the same time, generally speaking, uh... Most, I would, I, to me, the, the concept of an escape room requires at least a couple of people, right. <laughs> um, you know, the, the idea of a solo escape room just boggles my mind. I'm sure <laughs> there are some people who are even more introverted than I am who may crave that concept. Um, but as someone who doesn't like people in general, I still want people <laughs> to play with for an escape room. Um, yeah. and cause that interaction, in any form, even if you are, you know, for the most part, trying to do your own puzzles, the interaction and, and the, you know, the second checking and, and things mm -hmm. really makes for a lot of that uh, yep. experience. So overall, my family found Black Brim 1876 to be one of the most enjoyable escape room in a box experience we played. And honestly, we've ranked up quite the pile of completed games in this genre at this point. Um, we love the fact the puzzles in the game were independent of each other, which led us to divide and conquer. Uh, this gave everyone a feeling of control and agency, right? Everyone had a chance to try to do it on their own. My kids in particular loved that. They had their own thing to work on and do and still left room, though, to work together. But it let the kids play on their own until they felt they needed help that they asked for instead of us kind of driving the narrative, which I loved. Puzzle mix was interesting and just challenging enough to keep us engaged without getting to that point of being frustrated. As long as you're willing to, you know, 
allow for the Google use. I, I'm sure yes. if you if you didn't have phones at the ready, I think oh. you probably would have had a very different experience. Well, I would have had to use more of those clues. I'm, I'm sure the clues eventually would have told me what I Googled if I went deep enough down that would have let me solve the puzzles. Now, if you've got a group of friends and or family that love solving puzzles, you really can't go wrong picking up Blackburn 1876. Compared to all the other escape room games we played, this is the best multiplayer experience we've had. Instead, if you're looking for a solo puzzle experience, I think there's better options out there than this game from Puzzling Pursuits. I really feel this is best as a group experience. Now, you should also probably look elsewhere if you're one of those people that's looking to solve a mystery. You're not getting your murder mystery dinner party style game here. This is not that kind of game. And it's not one of those, you know, CSI cold case files, follow the clues and solve the crimes. This is a, uh, the publisher is Puzzling Pursuits, right? That's well named. This is a puzzle solving experience. Well, that's it for our review of Black Brim 1876 from Puzzling Pursuits. Before we go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of this Escape Room in a Box experience over on the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, where you can see lots of pictures, which won't spoil anything, of this game. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, it was a busy week for me. Honestly, I think I got more gaming in in the last week than I have in the last three months. Uh, I don't know about combined, but at least individually. So the, the big one, the, the, the start one, the, the first time in a long time is I co-hosted a, my first public gaming event since 2019. I got to be the, the outdoor tabletop bellhop concierging. I got, I got to do my thing. Um, I worked with Ian from the CG realm to open it open gaming night at the barbershop bar, which is a very inclusive LGBT plus owned and operated combination of barbershop and bar, uh, which of course we just had the bar half. The barbershop half was closed. And I have to assume getting a haircut while playing games is kind of on the level of, you know, eating Cheetos while playing. So that wasn't allowed. Yeah. Getting hair, getting bits of hair out of your games is possibly harder than Cheeto does. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that would be so great. But anyway, great venue. Um, lighting could be a bit better. It's really good in the center. So get there early if you're ever going to have, have play games there and try to get a spot under all the nice bright lights. We The, the um, owner operators that were there were awesome about turning the music down, keeping the light up. Um, it was also nice to see that, that we basically had a dedicated space. It's not like there were a bunch of locals and drinking going on at the same time. Overall, though, we weren't sure what to expect, right? It, it's been a long time since I've hosted an event. Um CG Realm hasn't had an event since they moved. They've done a couple D&D nights, but that's about it. Uh, this was a brand new venue for a board game night. I will admit I played board games there on Ian's birthday before, but like it was never a board game night. Um, but we got a solid crowd. Um, what I loved about the crowd we had there is it was not a WGR game night crowd. It was very much a different crowd. It was a old friends and gamers that we've seen out many times. We did get regulars, as we'll call them. Um, we also got casual gamers just looking to have a few drinks to go out. Like probably patrons of the barbershop bar who, you know, enjoy Uno and Monopoly now and then. Um, then they were looking to be definitely casual, right? They were looking for light games and drinks. And then there were just some curious folk looking to find out what the night was about. It was like, oh, you're doing a board game night? What's going on what kind of games do we got um it was it was really nice to see that variety of people uh, and that sounds like a great mix you know yeah. there's a there's a certain balance you love to get and unfortunately for better or worse uh well-established board game nights tend to trend towards uh the people who've been there and been coming out over and over and over again and you're not getting as much of that new blood and in parts they can you know it can actually be daunting to bring in new blood because you know there are all these people who have obviously been mm -hmm. there forever and ever so you know that 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 fresh blood and the new people interested it's way easier to sort of find uh find those people who who want to jump yeah. in so games I saw played include Point Salad, uh, multiple rounds of Splendor. Splendor seemed to be the hit of the night. Lots of different groups trying Splendor. Hues and Cues, Bang the Dice Game, Magic the Gathering. There was a group who showed up and played Magic against each other all night. All the power to them. Uh, Garento, multiple rounds of Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which was probably the heaviest game I saw all night. Gloom, the card game. Chiseled, 
Uh, and probably at least one or two more I might have missed as I was playing and teaching games for most of the night. Uh, during the event, I personally taught Ven, Garinto, and Chiseled, while Deanna was often enough to teach Splendor to a table that showed up pretty late during the night. Well, that's great. And I mean, it's uh, and that's sort of a, a nice balance of games, too. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not getting your, your heavy gamers in there, but you're also not expecting that necessarily at a bar. You know, you're not, you're not going to be playing with a machine at a bar. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I have to also give a shout out to Justin, who was willing to teach Castles of Mad King Ludwig, being the one, you know, heavier gamer who was there. They got a group of interested players to play it that enjoyed it enough. They wanted to play a second round and included some more people the next time. So that was awesome. It's always nice when people show up to an event and are willing to teach the games they bring. We always appreciate that. Um, highlights for me included getting a family hooked on Hughes and Hughes uh, to the fact that they were begging Ian to get it into the store before Christmas so they could give it as a gift. Uh, teaching Chisel to some gamers, people we see all the time, including Ian, and seeing everyone love it as much as we did, um, which honestly helped boost my confidence in our review. Because I got to say, I, the, the last three years, we've been gaming with pretty much the same people, and that's it. And I get kind of worried that that's biasing our, our, our reviews, right? Like, I, I feel we have a good mix. Playing with Tori and Cat is very different than playing with my kids, which is very different than playing with my mother-in-law and sometimes my sister-in-law. But it's still not like playing with a wide variety of different people. So it was awesome to get a game out, playing it with a new group of people who were experienced gamers. And, like, they knew what deck building was. So getting to see a reverse deck builder was a cool thing to them. And having them not just like it, but love it. Like, like chiseled went over really well. There was a point we were playing that we were enjoying it so much that a crowd gathered and kind of came over and like, what are you playing? And we had two people that sat there the entire second half of the game. Like, well, why are you doing that? And what that, what's that card do? Oh, and that means this happens. Okay. So how do you score it? Which was awesome. Yeah, and of course. Oh. Yeah. Chiseled, chiseled is one of those games where it, it's a game where you look at it and you go, oh, this doesn't have table presence, except no. it does. Uh, it's it's got because of the way you're playing and how simple it is yeah. but the the number of interactions and the sort of strangeness especially of you know the the scoring method mm -hmm. um it's got more table presence than you would imagine yeah <laughs> but even people come up seeing all these body parts right just looking at what the cards are <laughs> on the table uh though i did learn a very important lesson in not perfect lighting the card backs can look similar and no deck should have 13 heads in it so before playing chiseled from now on i will count out all the cards and all the decks and honestly it was never a problem before because i haven't transported the game right. it's always been on my shelf and i pull it off and we bring it to my mother-in-law's but it's not being jostled around the way a box full of games is when i bring it to a public event uh the other big highlight of the night for me honestly has absolutely nothing to do with games and a hundred percent to do with the fact i got to try sean's coney dogs again and man he kept the recipe he kept he still has the magic he hasn't lost his touch on coney dogs and i found out after the fact that once sean knew that deanna and i were coming he rearranged his schedule so he would be the cook for the night so <laughs> that was pretty awesome thank you sean for the awesome conies and that's why i'm upset i missed out i've played all those games before but i don't get <laughs> coney dogs off you didn't enough. get conies yeah we're gonna have to plan a coney night if it's not the the next time they have this event so after that, Deanna and I came back home. We were still in the gaming mood, me in particular, because like I taught games way more than I played. I did. I did get to play. I played. Um, I I played chiseled and I played Hughes and Hughes, and that's all I got to play. Most of the rest of the night was me teaching, or just you know walking around making sure people were comfortable and they needed stuff. And hey, do you want to try one of these games and all that fun stuff? So after we got home, we were still in the gaming mood. So we got in some plays of two player games and I was able to convince Deanna to play new stuff, which doesn't happen often. So got to play two games off the pile of shame and obligation, technically the same pile in this case, uh, starting with Boba Mahjong, which ended up being really solid. So this is a, a five suit card game where you got number zero, which is a wild card to eight, and you're trying to do set collection. You're trying to make sets, right? Th thus the Mahjong name. Um, I would say it's closer to the Rummy, the Mahjong, but they're, they're kind of all the same thing. Um, the neat part here is you have your hand of cards, and then there's a market with three cards out, and you're building three card sets. Now you can use one card from the market 
and cards from your hand or just cards from your hand. And there's like a whole drawing cards and all that. I'm not going to get into the details here. I'm not trying to teach the game. But the neat part is once you make a set of three, you keep one of the cards. You put it by your rule reference card and it stays there till the end of the game where you're going to use it for scoring. The other two cards get discarded, but all the discards go into that market. So it's really neat way to manipulate that market. Then the next player is going to make sets and so on. Well, you keep making three card sets. And then in the end, when one player has made 10 sets, so you have 10 scoring cards or the deck runs out, both our games, we've made 10 sets. You then score, you flip over all your scoring cards. Then you use them to make your Boba, right? Like you're making your bubble tea at the end. What six ingredients do you want to use? And then you're going to score points based on sets. Um, what do you call it? Series sets matching cards, different ingredients, uh, number of same color, like all these different things you're going to score points for, player with most points wins. This was some really neat stuff to, to um, there was just neat stuff going on, like especially that discarding. Like you get your hand, you're like, I have seven reds. This is awesome. Or three sevens, and there's only four in the whole game. I get one more seven. That's going to be worth a ton of points. But you don't get to keep that hand. And when you use those three to make a set where well, you're ditching two of them that go out in the market and you know, the other players looking going, you already kept the seven. So I don't want you to get these. So either they're going to take them or they're going to bury them. And there's some really neat stuff going on there. It honestly felt kind of like set collection point salad, especially the way you were keeping scoring cards for the end. It was really neat. Now, when you, uh, so what I'm hearing is, Oh, even though you're the first person to get 10, uh, you're not necessarily the winner. No. There, no. there's you you 10 can just triggers the end game that just triggers that just triggers the scoring and and yes. you could get you know scoured by whoever's only got six yes <laughs> and actually one of the tiebreakers in the game is is the tiebreaker is whoever may had the least cards to build their score out of is the the first tiebreaker so like if you end up with the same score it's whoever did it with less cards that actually wins interesting all right so it's uh it's a better game to uh play than it is a drink to drink yeah, in my opinion, I, I I don't get the bubble tea craze at all. Maybe I just haven't had a good one. Some people have tried to convince me of that. Uh, if you know a good place in Windsor, maybe we can go out sometime and play uh, Boba Mahjong over some Boba. But I I, I don't think it's going to go over very well. <laughs> uh, only two plays so far. So a lot more gameplay to come with this one before we get to a formal review. Uh, my one concern was it didn't seem to matter exactly what you did for scoring. You got the same points for everything. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, so I'm sitting there with my 10 cards or seven cards and I'm like, well, I could make sets, but if I make sets, then I can't get the colors. And I do the math. I'm like, well, if I make sets, I get six points. And well, if I make colors, I get six points. But, so that felt a little weird, but again, two plays. We'll see how that goes. Next up, we cracked open my copy of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set. Yes, that's the full name. And finally, after removing all the film from the bases and standees, which is way too much work, we played through chapters one and two. Now, one of the things I love about this game is the fact it has this onboarding. So there were five chapters of the game. The first is you take these two characters. I take these two characters, take their decks, shuffle them here. We're already going to set initiative for you. So you don't have to think about it. These are the only status effects that are in play. You're going to use basic moves that can't be boosted and basic attacks that can't be boosted, or you're going to play a card in your hand. Go. And it's nice, simple, quick. You only played at 12 points. Nice, quick game. Chapter two. Here's all the characters in the game. Draft three each. Now, when you attack, you can boost. And when you move, you can boost, but mash all the decks together. And here's how to properly determine initiative. Then you get to the next chapter and it's like, oh, now you have cards for each of your characters. Now their basic and attack and move may be different. And then you play the next chapter and it adds more rules and eventually you get to chapter five, which is pretty typical of one of these games. But what I love is that you can play any of these chapters later. You can always go back to a previous style. Now, I don't think anyone's going to go to chapter one because you're stuck with set characters. But chapter two, knowing my two kids, I can totally see playing chapter five with my oldest daughter and playing chapter two with my youngest and having fun both ways. So the uh, the film on the standees, that's what actually brings it up to a weight of three from the mid weight it's supposed to be. It's, is it actually a weight three on board game geek? Cause that's it's way two off. Five. It's a two five. Okay. I'm like, wow, it better not be a weight <laughs> three. Cause man, I, and I gotta say like at, at a, at a, a one, 
it's probably a, a, a max of two, like like 1.5, right? Like not using Board Game Geeks, one is not a game, like barely a game scale. Using the what people tend to rate games, I, I would say chapter one's like a, like a 1.5. Chapter two's probably like a 1.75. Whereas at the end, when you got everything in there, we haven't gotten that far. We've only done chapter one or two. I think it might get up to that 2.5 level. But it's deceptive because it the game is designed to play at any of those levels, even when you add expansions. Like, you just don't use the character cards, and that removes a whole set of complexity that you don't have to worry about. Right. Now, the game itself is a skirmish game. Um, I feel like I'm playing Warhammer Underworlds. You played that one with me. You even have the three spots in the middle you're trying to control. Very much has that feel. I haven't played it, but it sounds a lot like Unmatched. It also gave me a lot of vibes of the Funkoverse games. And without the variable ways to play, this is all... You get points for standing on a spot for a full round, so you're still there next turn, and you get points for knocking opponents out. Now, when you knock opponents out, they come back the next time it's their activation. So there's no player elimination. I, it feels very video gamey. There is a really neat mechanic I like, though, is when you respawn, you can respawn on either starting part. So you can basically pop up at the other player's side of the board, which was kind of cool. I dig it. I, I only played two games, still a lot more to go, but there's a lot of good stuff going on. And best of all, this felt like a Disney game. Unlike, say, Disney Smash Up, which felt like a Disney expansion for Smash Up with all its weight and complexity and combos, I felt like I was playing a Disney game that I can happily play with my kids or I can throw in all the rules and play with my gamer friends. So a game for young Disney fans as well as people who grew up with Disney. I think they really nailed that one box for all types of Disney fans here that was missing from some other recent Disney games. Well, that's good. I mean, I have to say, personally for me, I'm a little kind of past skirmish games. I haven't played um I haven't played uh um Unmatched yet. Uh which I think is, you know, maybe may, for all I know may switch me over. There's a lot there of go. chat about Unmatched, but mm -hmm. uh even the Warhammer one. Yeah, it was it was a Warhammer game and and it and with the Warhammer world that's interesting to me, but the skirmish game part of it is kind of like mm, yeah. You know, it is what it is. Well, we'll have to have you try it before the review, just so you can talk about it as if you played it. But... No, absolutely. And uh, for those people who are who are, aren't aware, uh, this is actually based off of a online game, yes. on, an app as well, I believe. Yeah, um, it started as an app. It, yeah. it is a board game version of an app. Right. All right. The final game for me this past week uh, was heading over to Brenda's and finishing up Blackbrim. Uh, but I've already pretty much shared everything I have to say about that one in the review. Um, the only thing I will add here is that we also have La Famiglia, which is also from Puzzling Pursuits, and we're looking forward to diving into that box next and seeing if it's any different or if it's just a new theme with similar puzzles. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So more plays of Boba Majong, um, and the Sorcerer's Arena. I definitely want to try to get some more in some two player games. Uh, another thing that's on my list is to play smash up Disney with the kids and see just how well that goes or doesn't go. I still think one kid's going to love it and another kid's going to find it overwhelming, but we'll see. Um, I also still have a ton of stuff to unbox. I, the pile is growing. We have more stuff here. That sounded bad. Yep. We have more stuff piled up to the left over here to to unbox. And I just, I have a bunch of stuff behind me um, that still has to be in by. I haven't even touched that Valeria stuff and I feel bad because like I begged for that. I'm like, Glenn, please send me Valeria stuff. I'm a huge Valeria fan and it's still sitting behind me. I feel bad. Um, so yeah, I want to I wanna be able to try that out. If, or sorry, get some unboxings done. But you know what? This week, I have no idea. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have... Three Christmas concerts, two of which were attending a uh, big school year family Christmas party on the weekend. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what I actually get done. The two player games with Deanna, we've probably squeeze in. Um, the kids still have a lot of work to do cleaning up our front room so we can put up a tree. So that take cuts into gaming time as well. So we'll see how things go. All right. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Danielle and Owen Thomas, thank you both. John P. Kelly, thanks, Sean. Derek Hisson, thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew.
Thank you, Brian Van Beek. But that was the double bell. And everything's crashing to the floor and my shift's coming to an end and I'm going to have to do some mopping up. So it's time to lock the front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Before you go, don't forget, uh, you can head over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop to tip your bellhops, as well as get some cool bonus stuff like access to our show notes. Uh, what else we got? We got uh, lots of bonus audio, and I tend to write a, well, I don't tend to, I do it every week, write a behind-the-scenes blog post where you can find out some of the sausage making that goes into the show and our content. That wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our Pento Suite after show with three unboxings tonight. Yes. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.